And now to introduce Professor Carol Myers. Carol Myers is the Mary Grace Wilson Professor Emerita of Religion at Duke University. She received her AB in Bible from Wellesley College and her MA and PhD in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies from Brandeis University. Carol has lectured and published widely in several fields, biblical studies, archaeology and gender in the biblical world. A prolific scholar, she is the author of more than 450 articles, reports, reference book entries and reviews, and she's authored, co-authored or edited 22 books. Her reference work, Women in Scripture, is a comprehensive look at all biblical women, and her 2013 book, Rediscovering Eve, Ancient Israelite Women in Context, is a landmark study of women in ancient Israelite society, and of no doubt great relevance to today's topic. Other recent books include a commentary on the book of Exodus, and two ankle Bible commentaries on Haggai and Zechariah, and several excavation reports with Eric Myers. Among her co-edited volumes are Archaeology, Bible, Politics and the Media, and the Bible in the Public Square. At present, she's co-editing the Bloomsbury Handbook of Food in the Hebrew Bible in Ancient Israel, and the Oxford Handbook of Households in the Bible. As a field archaeologist, Carol has worked on numerous digs since she was an undergraduate and has been a staff member or co-director of numerous archaeological projects in Israel, including directing several of Duke University's archaeological projects in Galilee. She's also been a frequent consultant for media productions relating to archaeology and the Bible, and in addition, she served on the editorial boards of many reference works and journals. She's currently a trustee of the American Society of Overseas Research, ASOR, and vice president of the Albright Institute of Archaeological Research. She's also a member of the board of directors of the Dead Sea Scrolls Foundation and recently served as president of the Society of Biblical Literature. Among her many honors and awards is ASOR's P.E. McAllister Field Archaeology Award for her contributions to Near Eastern archaeology. Carol, a very great welcome. Over to you. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, and it's a, a great pleasure for me to be speaking to the AI, to the IA, AIAS, I'll get it right, um, Society. Actually, this is not my first time doing this. Almost 40 years ago, when my husband and I were at Oxford for the year, we did come down to London and, I, and give one of the lectures at that time. So it's, it's good to be back. And I wish I were in London and not here. Uh, I want to begin by saying something about the American writer Harriet Beecher Stowe. She was most famous, I think you would all know, for her 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which I believe is still read in the UK as well as in the US. And I do know that when it was first published, um, the year after it was published, it sold 300,000 copies in the US and a million in the UK. Um, no explanation for that, but it's an interesting factoid. What most people don't know is that Stowe's father and husband were scholars and clergymen, and that her father was the president of a theological seminary, and that she too, in addition to being a author, was a serious student of the Bible, especially biblical women, and that she wrote a little known book called Women in Sacred History, which was published in 1874. And in the introduction to that book, she makes two comments that I think are relevant to my topic today. She envisions the land of the Bible as divided into what she calls homesteads, each ruled by family governance, with, quote, the family as the central part of the state, and she refers to the married Israelite woman as, quote, the co-equal queen of the home. These comments suggest to, suggest to me two things. One is the primacy of the household in agrarian life, and two, the importance of women's household roles. Now, let me contrast Harriet Beecher Stowe's positive vision from many years ago of Israelite women with what I hear from students in the course I taught many years on women in biblical tradition. What I used to do is at the very beginning of the term, before we 
got into it at all, I would ask my students to take out a pencil and paper and write down what their general impressions were of women in ancient Israel. And then I collected these. What I read was that they almost always had negative impressions, even if they knew the stories of the matriarchs or some of the more prominent women like Miriam or Deborah. This, this is what I read, examples. Women were seen and not heard. Women were shrouded and quiet. I have few impressions, but subservience is what comes to mind. Women were vastly inferior to men in biblical times. And I think of women in the biblical period as being oppressed. Feminist biblical scholars, I have to say, both Jewish and Christian tend to echo these impressions and certainly point to women's general subordinate status. Judging from conversations I've had with, randomly with people and what I've read on the internet, at site, websites about women in the biblical world, the general public would go along with those students, considering women subservient to men and men in charge of the home as well as in public or communal life. So are these negative perceptions justified? Well, inspired by Stowe's comments, as well as by the organizers of this Zoom talk who asked me to speak specifically on women and the household in biblical antiquity, but also motivated by what I consider misconceptions and misperceptions of women's daily lives in the period of the Hebrew Bible, I do want to talk about women's work. But more than that, rather than simply describe their activities, which I will do, I also want to find out what the meaning of women's work would have been for themselves, for the women, and for their families and their communities. Too often, focus on daily life means just looking at the artifacts of daily life without attention to the people who use the artifacts. So today, sure, we're going to look at those artifacts, but we will also ask who used them. And did the people who use them interact with others who use them? And what was the meaning of their tasks and so on? So let me try to share my screen and we can proceed. Okay. So this is how we will proceed. There are three parts to what we'll be doing today. Um, we'll begin by looking at, at the sources that I'm going to use and looking at the setting for women's work in the household. Then we'll zoom in, zoom literally and figuratively on women's household activities and the economic roles and social significance of those activities. And then we'll think about meaning. We'll turn to evaluation. We begin, of course, with archeological materials. The items that were used in household work, of course, but those items were not gender noisy. Think about it, who used a given item? So identifying the tools of women's work means relying on ancient texts, biblical and others, and also ancient art and iconography but also in order to understand the social dynamics and the meaning of women's work, we, we turn to ethnography, to the role and meaning of women's activities in traditional agrarian societies that are similar to ancient Israel in terms of geography, economy, demography. So before we, we turn to women's work, let's look at the general context, which was the household. Note that I'm not saying house or family household, which was an agricultural unit for most Israelites, as many as 90% of them were farmers, agrarians. So considering the household anthropologically, we see that it had three components. The people who lived there, which was probably an extended family of some kind with a senior man and woman, their children, the spouses of married sons, and sometimes others, grandchildren if, if the elder couple lived long enough. 
Then there's the material aspect, which is why we can approach this archeologically. And that consists of not only the dwelling, but it's land and animals, all its artifacts and installations. And then the household consisted of activities, economic, which is what we're looking at today, but also reproductive, social, political, and religious. In short, the household was a basic unit of society, was the place where all basic needs, food, clothing, and shelter were produced. And probably most households were self-sufficient in the Iron Age. As the basic unit of society, Harry Beecher Stowe commented about the primacy of what she called the homestead, but I can call it the household, that the primacy of the household certainly was true, would have been true for ancient Israel. And I think that it, it, the household probably corresponds in some aspects to the fundamental unit of society mentioned in biblical texts, usually called the Beit Ab or father's household, but also in a few passages um, which reflect a, a woman's context, they're called Beit Aim or mother's household. Now, what did the, what did the actual dwelling look like? Well, they're, it's sometimes called a pillared house or a four room house. Uh, none of those titles exactly capture it, but you can see from these different drawings that different people have different ideas of what it may have looked like. Archeologists have only recovered the foundation. So the rest is, is conjecture. These households were located, um, many of them in small villages or even walled towns. Um, the biblical word ear, often translated city, is misleading because in many cases it really refers to a walled village. And this is a possible reconstruction what one of those small villages would have looked like. And it's based to some extent on what 19th century Palestinian villages looks like. Now, what about the activities? Let's say a little bit more about that. The emphasis on, is on women's economic roles and their significance. And to do so, we look first at food production, which was probably the most important part of the household economy and household life in general. It was certainly the most time consuming, as you'll soon learn. It consisted of growing crops and then transforming them into edible form. We will also look at, at two other major aspects of the household economy, textile production and making household implements or utensils. Now food, grain. Grain was the most important food in the Israelite diet. Lechem, the word for bread in the Hebrew Bible is sometimes used more generally to mean food. For example, when Jake in Genesis 31, when Jacob invites his kin to eat bread, he is really saying to have a meal, which is what he wanted to do with his kin before he left, before he leaves Laban's household. About six, 70 to 75 percent of a person's daily caloric intake was from grain. Bread, for the most part, probably, or also gruel or par. This is what you would really call a high carb diet. And it was typical in traditional cultures until quite recently. We know, for example, that workers building the pyramids received a ration of 10 loaves of bread a day. In Canada, a, 19, excuse me, a 1716 record shows that the British colonists consumed two pounds of bread per day. And in Sardinia in the 1930s, records show that bread constituted 78% of the daily diet. Now that would have been mainly for the people who were doing a lot of hard physical labor. Producing bread involved many tasks, plowing and sowing, harvesting, threshing, winnowing, making flour, baking. And as in all societies, some of the tasks were carried out mainly by men and some mainly by women. That's called the division of labor by gender. And some tasks were also done together. If necessary, there was crossover. Now, plowing and seeding, um, as you probably would have guessed, were largely men's work, as was threshing and winnowing. 
plow points are the archeological evidence of plowing and biblical text and ethnography both identify plowing as men's work. First uh, Samuel 8, 12, king, men will plow the king's lands and first Kings 19, 19 refers to the prophet Elisha plowing. Note three things. This kind of work is done in household fields away from the dwelling itself. These tax, tasks are time limited, a few days or weeks a year. And men mainly do this alone as the uh, photograph at the bottom of the screen shows. Harvesting um, was usually a cooperative effort of the whole family and just took place several days a year at several different times a year, depending on the crop. Uh, we have archaeological evidence of harvesting in the sickle or scythe. Iconography, uh, these Egyptian wall paintings show men and women next to each other. And texts, of course, refer to men and women working. We have a 7th century BC in inscription that mentions young men and women reaping. And then, of course, there's the Book of Ruth, where women are working together in the field. And notice also in ethnography, the, that photograph shows a group of women working together. And we'll get back to that concept in a few minutes. Now, the grinding, the making flour out of the seed, um, we have a lot of archeological evidence for that because this, only the seeds and not the outer husks of grain are edible and because the nutritional starch in the seeds cannot be easily digested if they're raw or whole. Grains had to be treated in a series of procedures, grinding and then usually heating to become edible. And of course, there's much archeological evidence for the grinding, the upper and lower grinding stones that you see in these photographs. And keep this in mind, there are often several sets of these tools found in a single dwelling. These sets of upper, lower, and lower grinding stones are probably the equivalent of the biblical term rechaim, um, which the NRSV says hand mill, but it, it's a dual form and it probably refers to these two objects being used together. Now, who did the grinding? Much evidence shows that it was women. Women were the ones who did the grinding. We know this from iconography as in this, uh, statuette from ancient Egypt. Ethnography shows women doing the grinding in places all over the world, actually, and several biblical texts. Isaiah 47, for example, personifies Babylon as a daughter and says, take the grinding stones and grind flour. Not only do women grind grain and carry out the other steps in making bread, kneading and then baking, which I'll get to soon, they do it together as indicated archeologically by the recovery, as I just mentioned, of multiple grinding tools in the same dwelling. Working together is actually quite common when activities like grinding are tedious and time consuming. It has been estimated that it took two to three hours a day to grind enough flour for bread for two adults and four children. A late 19th century traveler in Pal Palestine was where a local woman told a traveler that it took her five hours a day, quote, to grind grain for my family, which was not a particularly large one. Ancient iconography bears out the fact that women did this together, as you can see in several of these terracotta models. And ethnography too, around the world shows women grinding or kneading together. As for textual evidence, well, nothing in the Hebrew Bible is directly relevant, but two somewhat later sources are, Matthew 24 mentions two women grinding together, and the Palestinian Talmud in Sachim mentions three women kneading together. Uh, this reconstruction shows women working together. Uh, surrounded by that red band, which I put there to show you a group of women all within talking distance to each other, whereas the men are scattered about um, it working individually. We see a similar pattern for baking bread. 
The archaeological evidence for baking um, appears in the ovens that are found at, at virtually every archaeological site. And some of similar ones have been shown in Syria, Turkey, various places in the Middle East where they're used to this very day, which is what you see in the bottom photograph. But not every dwelling had its own oven. Beehive ovens like this are often found in courtyards or outside an outside area, which is near several dwellings. And it indicates that women from several households use the same oven, um, which we know from ethnography. And there's one biblical text that refers to sharing an oven. In this instance, specifically in terms of scarcity, 10 women shall bake your bread in a single oven. In Mediterranean lands, it's common, actually common to have communal bread ovens where fuel is often scarce. And it's still done in some places even today. Uh, an early 20th century report says that, quote, ovens were a favorite meeting place for the women of the village. Usually four to five women share an oven, each taking turns to provide fuel. Now, women's other economic activities include processing other foods, textile production, and making tools and ovens. These are some of the other foods. Um, there, are, there are remains of them. There's seeds and other parts of them have been recovered by bioarchaeologists, um, but we don't have particular archaeological remains of how they were processed. But we can assume that um, women had a large part in preparing them. We know a lot more about textile production that also shows women working together in spinning and weaving. The archeological evidence for spinning are the spindle, ubiquitous, I should say, spindle whorls, um, which are found in virtually all periods in uh, sites in Eretz Israel. They, they were used to spin wool to make threads. And we know that spinning was women's work. Um, Several biblical texts mention it. The end of Proverbs 31, the, and we'll, I'll mention that again later, talk about her hands holding the spindle. Uh, Ugaritic text mentions a goddess with a spindle. And in traditional textile producing areas, women are seen even to this day doing the spinning. And ancient iconography shows women at work spinning. And I, I, I should have mentioned as I flash this on the screen <laughs> that women are, are usually shown doing this together as in a Greek vase painting and is in various ethnographic settings. We also have loom weights, which are used to hold the bottom of the vertical loom, which was probably the kind that was used in the Iron Age in Palestine. And women were the weavers. We know this from texts. Uh, the, in Judges 16, Delilah weaves Samson's hair, hair on a loom. And Proverbs 31, which I mentioned before, doesn't actually mention weaving, but we know that the woman gathers flax and wool and makes garments. And they do this together very often, as iconography shown shows and as the biblical texts about women, plural, we weaving for Asherah. Ethnographically, again, groups of women working together to weave various kinds of garments or clothing. Now, other activities, this is lots harder to pin down and we know what the utensils, pottery tools look like. Uh, here are some examples of these essential aspects of household life, pottery, ovens, stone vessels, tools. The theory is that women traditionally make the tools or implements that they use. And there are certainly ethnographic evidence from Middle Eastern um, peoples, communities of women doing these things. Now in, in urban areas, there may have been workshops in which men produce them, but in, in Agricultural villages, um, women probably made most of the tools that were used in their home, except ones 
that involved women. They were female craftspeople. Whoops. Now let me summarize this briefly before we start trying to put it all together. Bread production and many other important tasks were women's work. The, uh, we look at the artifacts and can, can identify the gender of who used them. Also important is that women frequently worked together to make bread, textiles, and various household tools and installations. And what I haven't mentioned before, but is also important, is that women's bread production and other economic tasks, like weaving, making pots and ovens, involved technical expertise and skill. Now, how can we evaluate all this? The challenge is to, the challenge is to evaluate the work of women without succumbing to the, I get there. Yeah, I skipped too many, sorry I for anticipating. The challenge to evaluate the work of women without succumbing to the pitfalls of presentism, by which I mean the projection of present day attitudes and gender patterns onto the biblical past. Think about this, we cannot, evaluate Israelite women's work according to current situations and values. The way traditional societies, both ancient and more recent ones, viewed women's work often differs radically from the way they're viewed now. For example, in today's industrialized world, tasks performed by men in general, this is not 100% true now, but in general, they tend to be more highly valued than those carried out by women, especially household tasks. Household tasks in general are not very highly valued. So evaluating the, the meaning of the work of Israelite women in the household means acknowledging the important, uh, importance of the commodities that women made. And bread is the best example. Bread, for example, equals life. Unlike today, when we can certainly have a meal without bread, that was impossible in biblical antiquity. Bread was the main food for most people. As I mentioned, as much as 70% of a person's daily caloric intake was grain-based. Life depended on bread. Also, bread was the nexus of household life. It was central to family life as many ethnograph ethnographic reports indicate. One source I looked at says, life revolved around bread. Also keep in mind that bread and other foods, textiles, pots, ovens, and so on, were not available commercially, except maybe towards the end of the Iron Age in some of the truly urban areas. But unlike today, every household had to produce bread and most, if not all of these other commodities, and women were the producers. Bread making and textile production and making pots or ovens was a social process. Unlike today, making all these things meant women did it together. They ground flour together, baked bread together, spun together, wove together, made pots or ovens together. The daily activities carried out in a household were not simply vehicles for the survival of the members. I mean, they were that, of course. As ethnographers have pointed out, they were social and also part of social process. And women's joint activities were an active component of social relations. I'm gonna say a little bit more about this because there are two really important aspects of the fact that women were socializing while they worked. First, when women, <clears throat> when women spend many hours together every day, they inevitably share valuable information about the techniques of their tasks. Experienced women teach younger relatives or neighbors. I mean, how did you learn how to bake bread or weave and so on? You didn't take a course, you didn't go to the internet, you learned it from somebody more experienced. And just as important, Perhaps even more important, women spending many hours every day in each other's company 
form what we can call informal women's networks. And these networks, <clears throat> as we know from ethnography, serve as a major form of communication in a world without phones, the internet, radio, or television. Women share information about themselves and about their families while they're talking and working together. And this knowledge in turn fostered communal well being in a world without NGOs or government social services. In other words, women's networks served as mutual aid networks. Now, how does this work? Well, for example, if the senior male in a household was injured and couldn't plow his fields, the women would know about this and would send someone, perhaps an older son, to assist. Or they would know if a woman was too ill to carry out her household responsibilities and they would send someone to help or food or both. Ethnography has shown that informal women's networks are essential for the viability of traditional societies like ancient Israel. Now, finally, bread was sacred in a way that we don't usually recognize in the modern world. But in traditional societies, it's still sacred. Uh, a journalist in a book that you published in 2011 about life in Lebanon, um, and this is a, a, an American woman who married a Lebanese man and she got used to living with his, his family and friends. And she reports that in the Middle East, life revolved around bread. I mean, this is only 10 years ago, she was writing this. If a piece of bread fell to the ground, the person would pick it up, kiss it, and press it, press it to her forehead before putting it back on the counter. And I've read many other reports from around the Mediterranean area, which report the same process of kissing a dropped piece of bread. Bread was sacred. And as such, it also represents the labor that produced it. And the labor itself is thereby sanctified, women's labor. So given the centrality and the sanctity of bread in household life, women's role in producing it had implications for household dynamics, far different than in today's world. And let me mention a few. First of all, producing a major household commodity and avail available in no other way gives women personal power. As ethnography has shown, women who control bread production also make decisions about the organization of labor the use of household space and the distribution of food. And this kind of decision-making was not a trivial matter. It, it made the senior women in the household and essentially served, serving as household managers. It certainly contests the common notion that I mentioned at the beginning of our time together of women's powerlessness or subordination. Second, women's role in bread pr producing made them channels of communication and mutual aid. And this gave them social power beyond the household. And another point is that producing bread and other household commodities required considerable technological expertise that was considered a kind of wisdom in ancient Israel. And as the noted anthropologist Jack Goody once said, even in the simplest societies, women who had these skills were believed to work wonders. Women's expertise, therefore, gained them respect. Now, women as household man as managers is evident in several biblical texts about senior women serving as household managers. A colleague of mine called them COOs or chief operating officers. Um, I think that I'll, I'll just take a few minutes to go over the story of the Shunammite woman, woman with you. She's one of my favorite, even though she's unnamed. This is in 2 Kings 4 and 8. The prophet Elijah is visiting her town. She invites him to a meal. She notes that he's frequently in the vicinity, so she decides he should really have a room of his own in her house. And so she has a room prepared for him. Alicia is grateful and he offers to commend her to the king or the general. And she declines saying that her standing among her people needs no intervention. 
In other words, she has some standing in the community. The prophet says that he'll then take care of what she seems to have, an infertility problem. She has no children. And he does that, and she bears a son. And some years later, this child is in the fields with his father and becomes ill, and this father sends him home to his mother. Sadly, the child dies on her lap, but she fetch, fetches the prophet again, who revives the child. But the story doesn't end there. Alicia, the prophet, tells her, not her husband, to take her household to another place to get relief from a severe drought, which is about to happen. So she does this. And later when the drought ends, she comes home and discovers squatters on her property. She goes directly to the king and asks for help. And the king listens to her, restores her house and her land, and even the, uh, gives her restitution for the produce that would have come from the lands during her absence. So several notable features about this story. She makes decisions autonomously, inviting the prophet to her home. She undertakes a renovation project. She moves away to escape the drought. She appeals to the king for restitution. She tends, albeit successfully, to the ill son. She certainly has status in her community when she convinces the prophet that she needs nothing special from the king or his general. She's the one the prophet tells to leave with her family because of the drought. And she interacts readily with a prophet and with the king. She's a woman in charge with considerable decision-making power in her household and status in the community. In sum, to return to Harriet Beecher Stowe, she was not only right in thinking about the agricultural household as the main unit of society in biblical times, but I think she also was onto something when she designated women the co-equal queen of the home. She understood that women's household work afforded them considerable household power and wealth, worth. She says further that they were, quote, honored and obeyed. And as, as I said before, they could be called the COO of their household. This evidence of household power of senior women, at least, calls into question the persistent idea, idea of female subservience in all aspects of household life. Here, I'd like to quote an Anglican priest, the Reverend C.T. Wilson, who was vicar of Totland Bay on the southern tip of the Isle of Wight. Before that, he was a missionary in Palestine for a, quite a long period of time in the 19th century. And he made many observations, took careful notes, and he published a semi-anthropological work called Peasant Life in the Holy Land, in which he says that in contrast to the situation in towns, peasant women are the equals of their husbands and even rule the family. And this resonates, by the way, with the views of the ancient Greek historian Xenophon, who considered the family roles of women and men complementary with their powers being divided, he said. But he also said in some instances, women have authority over their spouses. Similarly, in the biblical past, female subordination was not a functional reality in major aspects of everyday life in, Is in Israelite households. The senior woman was in charge and managed daily routines as well as so social interactions with other households. Now, I'm not claiming that women were equal to men in society in general, but in terms of many aspects of household lives, men and women were, inter were interdependent, and in many other aspects, women were in charge. So Stowe's term, co-equal, still rings true for ancient Israelite women. So I will stop sharing my screen and let you all Come on and tell me what else we can talk about. Carol, on, on behalf of us all, thank you very much indeed. An absolutely fascinating insight into not only the role of women, but the society generally. I think it's quite easy for us in our industrial and possibly post-industrial society to overlook the importance of labour generally as 
um, the key to what is or was in essentially a rural society. We don't quite have those sort of concepts now. And I think you really, really brought that home to us. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm looking at the uh, chat, but perhaps I can start, if I may, with a question. Um, you, you, you present a picture of essentially an agrarian society, or at least in a non royal sphere, an agrarian society. Um, it is, I guess, implicitly um, not that the, the, there's not a significant disparity of wealth, largely. Um, that may not be absolutely true, um, but if there were, then you might, for example, see the rise of the merchant class. And I think most people believe that a merchant class, other than for things that cannot be um, made in the village, like metal tools, for example, didn't exist until fairly late on, possibly Hasmoneans, possibly not. Is your view, therefore, that the society that you present was essentially a static one for pretty well all of the biblical period? The um, great acclaim, I don't think any society is totally static, but I think there are certain things in traditional societies that really remain pretty much the same from generation to generation to generation. So I would have to look individually at the, the kind of issue or the kind of role or the kind of work that um, you're, you might be interested in to see whether it would be static in terms of that particular thing. Um, whether households were, all these agrarian households were more or less um, equal in terms of wealth, hard to tell. There's been a lot of discussion about the size of these pillar dwellings or four room dwellings um, to, to try to answer that question. Does a larger dwelling mean that it was a wealthier household or rather that it was a larger household with more members of the extended family? Um, archaeologists are going back and forth in that. I don't think we have a consensus yet. Uh, I can't imagine that there weren't some households that did better than other households, but one, one of the fascinating things is there, even in, in households that may be wealthier by virtue of size, there does not seem to be the existence of more um, what we might call luxury items than in other households. So it's, it's a really interesting question about whether, as some archeologists might say, there was an egalitarian ethos. Uh, that may be putting it too strongly, but it may move in slightly in that direction. Thank you. And, and I note actually that and um, Jim West um, asks a broadly similar question, but also asks, um, um, would the women have been able to sell merchandise, um, assuming presumably that their efforts at production were surplus to requirements? I, I tell Jim to look at Proverbs 31, where it seems that at least by the time that that book takes shape, there is a wealthy woman who is selling her merchandise. Uh, the fact that we have several looms, sometimes side by side in houses may indicate a kind of workshop where there were textiles being made for, uh, for sale out elsewhere. Uh, the household as a whole would, would stand to gain economically from doing that, uh, whether they were this, these were organized um, workshops or whether that was just to, up to the individual household, whether they would want to go in that direction. I suppose it would depend on whether how, how many sheep they had and how much access to, to wool they had. Um, but, but certainly, especially as we move on into the Iron Age, there's more and more evidence for uh, commercial exchanges um, perhaps markets in some of the larger towns, as we see in much later periods in Eretz Israel. Thank you. Now, there's a, I think, a very interesting question from, and I'm afraid um, I only have Terence rather than a surname. Perhaps Terence could identify himself um, and ask your question about nomadic groups. If Terrence, not, where are you? What's your unmute yourself and tell us what tell me what your question is. 
Anyway, that blew my mind. Very good. Uh, uh, yes, you're not. You're not. Uh, uh, do you, uh, yeah. Um, no, the question. The question really was about tent dwellers and oh. whether it was still the same division of labour in in a nomadic in a nomadic society, because you gave us the idea of the permanence of the home where things could be much more structured with a greater fluidity if you're having to, to move around the whole time. Well, I, honestly, I, I don't know much about nomadic society. I would say that, that we don't have nomadic society in, the, in Iron Age Israel, that there certainly were, what, keeping animals, animal husbandry was an important part of an agricultural household, but they, they, took their, their flocks out to high pastures in certain times of year, kept them close to the home or sometimes in the home. One of the theories of the four room house is that the one of the long rooms on the ground floor actually held animals in the winter months. They probably didn't have large herds um, unless they were extremely wealthy. So um, we don't really, I, I don't know how we would go about trying to find out information about true nomads and the division of labor. Um, that, Probably ethnographers could help us the best with that. Thank you. So, um, a very specific question from Liz Freed. If, 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 if you'd like to uh, unmute yourself, Liz, and ask that one. Hi, hi. thank you very much for your talk. Um, Nehemiah 3 and 11 refers to the Tower of the Ovens. And I'm wondering if that. Uh, implies professional bakers or that women would just, since they lived in a city, that they would all bring their bread to and use the public ovens. Well, Have you ever thought um, about that? First of all, Nehemiah is not an Iron Age text. I'm talking about the Iron Age. It's, it's post-exilic. Um, okay, all right. Okay. And it's it's an urban setting. Right. You can also, however, look at Jeremiah Jeremiah, yeah, I don't know. And, Jeremiah. In, any, um, in, any, in, in any case, I, I certainly think that there were um, commercially available flour, if not bread, in urban settings, and that men may have been involved in, in working in those in those workshops. But let, let me what was your what was your question though? I think I missed your question by getting off on the tangent about. Nehemiah. Oh, I, I just were there, were there commercial? Listen, there were certainly ovens, and and this is true in parts of rural France and Turkey. There, to this very day, there are ovens that are shared by women, or where women bring their their casseroles or their their <laughs> their bread their bread loaves ready to be baked to a communal oven. I mean, it just makes sense to share that um, for fuel reasons and labor reasons. So um, it, the Tower of Ovens in Nehemiah, I'm not, I don't know what, what specifically that refers to, but it could be to a, a communal oven, a communal bakery. But not necessarily professional bakers. It could. It, no, it could, it could. And the reference in Jeremiah refers to Baker Street in the English translation. Right, the street it's of the not bakers. in the Hebrew. What does it say in the Hebrew? I don't have it in front of me. Um, it, it, that from outside that they brought him bread from outside from outside interesting and that's true yeah there, as i said it, jeremiah of course is the very end of the iron age and he's in a city so there may very well have been um commercial bakers but i'm gonna go back and look at that text again thanks for putting pointing that out <laughs> if, if i may add an addendum as somebody who from the non rabinovitz sides comes from a long line of bakers um, in, oh. in, in modern day or relatively modern days in Eastern Europe um, to have a sharp distinction between professional bakers and home bakers, I think is probably going to be erroneous because quite often the, the professional bakers allowed their ovens to be used by the community for certain things anyway. So, mm -hmm. so perhaps, and I'm, I'm, back projecting a couple of thousand years perhaps inappropriately but but giving a sharp distinction between professional and home baking may not have been appropriate then as it wasn't in 19th century um lithuania for example 
Perfect. Um, let's let's move on from the world of baking, one that um, <laughs> personally fascinates me, but not so much everybody else, um, uh, or less perhaps. Um, um, yeah, a, a, a similar but not quite the same the question is um, um, from Marion. Um, and if I may, I'll, I'll, I'll just add this an addenda. It, it, even if there was not a market economy, might there be a barter economy? Well, I think I think even a market was a barter economy. I mean, we don't have Well, money. sorry, I, I meant market within the context of an intervening financial system. Oh, OK. No, I think I think that um, probably there probably there was informal bartering. Um, if a family had uh, had excess, they may have traded it for a family that had an excess of something else. But I don't know how we can know that for sure, except looking at um, ethnographic reports. Thank you. Um, I think we've probably done justice to most of the, um, if not all of the um, chat questions. Can, can I just broaden this a bit, perhaps as a, as a final question, Carol? We talk about Israelite society. To what extent would the societies around have been pretty similar or not, so far as you can tell? I'm going to look at ethnography again. The fact that it's not ethnographic reports, which come from, from communities around ancient Israel, that is from from people in, in Asia Minor, Syria, Je um, Lebanon, Palestine, that these ethnographic reports um, are from peoples around ancient Israel. So they would, I mean, modern Israel, and their an their ancestors were the people around ancient Israel. Okay. And these things have have carried down for centuries and centuries and centuries um, until modernity or urban life. Um, makes some important change or leads to important changes. But the traditional ways of doing things um, last and last and last. Uh, we were fortunate to, a number of years ago, to go around in rural Turkey with a, a Turkish friend of ours. And he took us to where his women, his mother and, and aunts were gathered together around an oven baking bread together. So I, I think that in traditional Middle Eastern societies, uh, people do things in quite the same way as people did in ancient Middle Eastern societies. Um, Israelites, Moabites, Edomites, um, all would have carried out their ag agricultural household life in much the same way. So when we when we focus on Israel, we shouldn't really forget that that, that ancient Israel is itself part of a wider Middle Eastern society. Um, right. In that sense, and I think that's 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 maybe self-evident, but it's nonetheless quite important. Um, but I'm I'm trying to find, yes, for, uh, just um, as a, a um, Cheryl Matthews asks a very interesting, if slightly more modern question. Um, um, Cheryl, if if you're still here, would you like to ask the question? I think it's a, it's a good one, Cheryl. Are you around? Maybe not. Well, yes, I'll, oh, yes, yes, you are. Yes, I can see you. Um, I just had to get to the, the uh, microphone. For years and years, I've heard that phrase that um, this probably came up with your questions with your students, that men uh, kind of degraded women and didn't think highly of them. And so there is a Jewish prayer that says, thank God I'm not a woman. Hello, yeah. hello, Asani Isha. Okay. <laughs> so how does that fit with what you were saying with the honor and the respect that they have in the home? Then why would a man turn around and thank God that he's not a woman? Well, that's, that's in the rabbinic period. And I don't know if a man in our age would say such a thing. And the, the structure of society was much different in the rabbinic period. And in the rabbinic period, the, the household was not dependent upon a woman's labor in quite the same way because there were markets and there was money 
and people could buy things. They weren't dependent upon the woman for making everything in the household. So uh, now that's a very problematic um, quotation. And I think there are people in this who are here today who could say more about it than I can. But I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I would say that the world was very different by the time you have a man making that statement in a uh, religious setting. And I don't, I don't know what that would imply about what their households were like and the role of women in those households. Maybe, is there somebody else here who could comment on that? Tessa? Liz, would you like, Liz, Liz has her hand up and indeed relates uh, Liz, to yeah, Liz, Liz. I, I have been told that it's because men have more, uh, that doesn't make sense. Men have more commandments and that therefore, that they have to obey and that therefore in, they're in some other, I don't know. That doesn't make sense anymore. So I. I <laughs> <laughs> no, it could, it could make sense. <laughs> Yeah, now I can't do this one either. <laughs> is, is the conclusion therefore simply that um, we should not retroject the apparent views of the rabbinic commun uh, uh, um, community on something potentially a thousand years before? Or a that's thousand years after. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that's for sure. Uh, is this not something that uh, men are delighted about, that uh, as a daily blessing, that they, they make for not being made a woman who has to go through childbirth. I think this is uh, possibly part of the answer. Did the cats? Yes. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. This is, I think, what we are taught, what some people are taught. Well, you may be taught that, but I'm not sure that that's, that's how it originates either. But I, I again, that's, that's out of my field, rabbinics. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're probably now, I'm just checking all through the chats. I wouldn't want to uh, shortchange anybody, but I think one way or the other, we probably covered um, what people would like to know. Um, I think it therefore remains for me to say on behalf of us all, Carol, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us. Well, this evening here, um, lunchtime, um, where you are or approximately, um, and, um, um, an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you very much indeed. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you, Carol. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Good. Hello, With that, I'll say bye to everybody and see bye -bye. you um, at our next lecture, which I think is in approximately four December. Weeks. Yes, 16th of December. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Very good. Bye to everybody. Bye. -bye. Stay well, everyone. Absolutely. You too.